Hey folks, Eric back with you. We're going to start video number two of our ventilator management series. Today we're going to specifically look at FIO2. Everything that we think about FIO2, the basics all the way up to uh, oxygenation toxicity, uh, acute and chronic conditions, and how all that relates to how we apply FIO2 to our patients. So come join me and we will see you in a second. Hey everybody, this is Eric back with you. We're going to jump into our series on transport ventilation. This is going to be video number two of, of a multi-part series on, on oxygenation, pathophysiology, transport ventilation, everything transport ventilation we're going to cover in this um, series. So come join us. Today's lecture is going to be on FIO2. There's a lot of things that we can discuss on FIO2. Hopefully this video will be about 10 minutes, so let's jump in. FIO2 is called fraction of inspired oxygen. We know that oxygen is part of atmospheric air. Atmospheric air is made up of multiple gases, nitrogen being 78%, and then oxygen being 21%. There's other small gases at you know, real low amounts uh, that I'm not going to really get into. Um, but all of that is called Dalton's gang or Dalton's law. The amount of oxygen um, amount of nitrogen, amount of all those gases equals 100%. But when we think about oxygen, we have to understand that we deliver oxygen with different sources, our non-rebreather, our nasal cannula, and things like that. But on a ventilator, we actually deliver it based on a percentage. So we can actually dial in that percentage based on what we want to give. 21% being uh, room air, that's what we take in atmospheric air-wise, or 100% being um, the most amount we could give on the ventilator. So it's represented as far as when you document this, you can either say 21%, but most often it's it's in a decimal uh, symbol. So 0.21 is gonna be 21%, or if you were gonna do 100%, it's gonna be 1.0, that equals 100% FIO2. The patient's FIO2 may be varied by adjusting the ventilator up and down, and we have to understand that this is a concept based on the approach of the patient again, and I come back to the approach. In the acute situation, if you're dealing with a patient in an acute um, response to an injury or illness, going 100% on your FIO2 is absolutely fine, absolutely perfect. We should never worry about any adverse effects uh, from delivering 100% FIO2. But it's important to understand everything regarding FIO2, the potential risk for toxicity. Well, what does that mean, toxicity? How can we have toxicity based on oxygen? Well, we're going to jump into that. The other concept is a, a term called absorptive atelitasis, and we're going to look at that. So when we think about oxygen, we think about oxygen. Oxygen is something that we're truly not meant to utilize as a fuel, but our body has um, systems, catalyst systems, enzyme systems to utilize oxygen as a fuel. And we utilize that to um, oxygenate all of our, our tissues for cellular function, for ATP production and things like that. So if we think about oxygenation, oxygenation or an oxygen molecule is broke down and utilized and turned into water for purposes of ATP production and ATP synthesis in the electron transport chain. 95% of the oxygen that we take in at every time is turned into water and the other 5% of that is turned into what's called free radicals. Free radicals are macrophages um, uh, that, that attack our cells that uh, leak into the cytosol and then they leak out of the cells. They attack the lipids, the proteins, the, the, the fats, um, or I should say lipids, proteins, and carbohydrates. And they start breaking down those tissues. They start breaking down the epithelial tissues. They stop protein s synthesis. And this is something that is very, very normal. When we bring in, breathe in room air, our body has um, systems to kind of counterbalance that not a big deal but if we give a patient a hundred percent oxygen for a prolonged period of time you could see that that can become an issue that's what causes and starts a lot of the inflammatory cascades that lead to secondary issues like ARDS 
like DIC, um, issues that eventually will kill our patients. So it's important to understand that oxygen is a great thing, but oxygen needs to be delivered in a way that optimizes their physiology. So let's trace an O2 molecule. O2 molecule comes in our mouth uh, from a uh, atmospheric air source. We base that on a partial pressure of oxygen. And that's what's called Dalton's law. Dalton's law is based on the percentage of, of oxygen based on the actual barometric pressure or atmospheric pressure that we're currently at. So we utilize sea level as an example. At sea level, the pressure is 760 millimeters of mercury. And if you multiply it 760 by 21% or 0.21, you'd get a partial pressure of oxygen of 159 approximately. That's important because that's the amount of oxygen that's readily available for use. So a higher partial pressure of oxygen is better. As we bring that O2 molecule under our mouth or that atmospheric air under our mouth that encompasses nitrogen as well, that O2 molecule gets uh, diluted. And so the dilution brings the partial pressure of oxygen down to about 100, 104. As it travels down our bronchioles, goes into our alveolar membrane or our alveolar sacs, I should say, we are sitting at a high concentration. And so this is where we start talking about diffusion, Graham's law. Graham's law is the, the process of diffusion going from a high concentration to a low concentration. All right, well, where's the low concentration? The low concentration is the deoxygenated blood that's returning from our heart. It's carrying oxygen that needs to be um, uh, offloaded. It needs CO2, the CO2 needs to be offloaded, and it's looking to have our hemoglobin, our, our red blood cells, our plasma, um, having good oxygenated blood um, join that. So we have O2 that is diffusing through the alveolar capillary membrane into the capillaries, you have a high concentration of PO2, and it's waiting to oxygenate that deoxygenated blood. So that's very, very important to understand. What's left over is nitrogen. Nitrogen is 78% of our atmospheric air. So when we breathe, breathe in air, we're not just breathing in oxygen, we're breathing in all of atmospheric air, which is nitrogen, argon, hydro, hydrogen, and things like that. Well, 78% of that atmospheric air is nitrogen. Well, what happens to that nitrogen? When the O2 diffuses through that alveolar capillary membrane, the nitrogen, a little bit of it leaks out and, and diffuses, but nitrogen is a very dense, heavy gas. And a big majority of that remains in the alveoli. Well, that's important because that's what actually gives us our intrinsic PEEP. And we know that intrinsic PEEP is between three to five centimeters of water, but it allows our alveoli to remain open during our exhalation process. When we breathe in, remember, it's a very easy active process. We take in air, um, that's what recruits our alveoli, that's what's called increasing our functional residual capacity, uh, inflating those lung fields. And when we exhale, we have to have something that maintains the pressure in our alveoli so it doesn't collapse. We don't want atelitasis. We don't want alveoli that collapse. Well, that's exactly what our body does by utilizing that nitrogen that remains in the alveoli. So now let's look at FiO2 from the perspective of how it can hurt us. Well, I've already laid out the aspects of FiO2 and the free radicals. And so if you think about a chronic syndrome, and I mean chronic syndrome, I'm thinking about an ICU patient that's septic that is gonna be on the ventilator for a week, two weeks. We have to think about if we had high concentrations of FiO2 for a long period of time, think about the free radical aspect. If you have 100% FiO2 and 5% of that is constantly turning into free radicals, which attack the cells, attack the epithelials, destroy the lipids, the proteins, the carbohydrates, that decrease or stop protein synthesis, think about what that's gonna do. That's gonna increase or start a massive inflammatory cascade. So for that type of patient, you wanna dial down that FiO2 as low as you can go to ma still maintain an SiO2 or an oxygen saturation of at least 92, 93%. That's your goal. So if that means that your FiO2 is 30% or 0.30, to maintain an O2 sat of 92, 93%, then that's exactly what you need to do. We don't need an oxygen saturation any greater than that. And that's a misnomer 
from how we were taught in school initially. So think about that. The other aspect is absorptive atelectasis. And I said that in normal gas exchange, we bring in that nitrogen, we bring in that oxygen in atmospheric air. And we have a remaining amount of nitrogen that is left in the alveoli. Because, it, remember, that's a dense gas. Well, if we have a prolonged amount of high FiO2 in our patients, ICU patients, and you have uh, this phenomenon where you're constantly delivering a high amount of oxygen, you're, you're going to eventually diffuse or push out the nitrogen out of our alveoli. This is no different than the concept that you've been taught regarding rapid sequence innovation. In the acute situation, rapid sequence innovation, you're taught to provide the highest amount of oxygen in multiple ways to drive nitrogen out. It's called nitrogen washout. We're trying to drive up our PaO2. We're trying to drive up our partial pressure of oxygen in our plasma as high as possible to give us that time to RSI patients because they're gonna be apneic. Well, that's the same concept here. Only now we're thinking of this more long term. We're not thinking this over a couple of minutes. We're thinking this over hours and days. Well, think about if we constantly are driving out the, the nitrogen out of our uh, alveoli, what's there left to maintain alveolar recruitment? There's nothing. And so you're going to have the phenomenon called absorptive atelectasis, And that's exactly what it is. It's prolonged FiO2 that causes nitrogen washout for a long period of time that causes atelectasis or alveolar collapse. And that's a bad, bad thing. So there's a lot that goes into FiO2. It's not as simple as just giving a percentage and, and, and saying, all right, things are going to be good. But it's important to understand the pros and cons. Now let's jump into kind of the treatment application. Again, we want to maintain the lowest FiO2 possible to maintain that O2 set of 92-93%. That's very important. In the acute patient, like I said, you're never going to go wrong for giving 100% FiO2. But get in the habit of looking at your patient critically. Think about it critically and think, do they need 100% FiO2? Do I have an O2 sat that's adequate? What's going on with my patient? Very, very important. Because ultimately, we just want to maintain good tissue perfusion. We want to maintain good hemodynamic status, good cardiac output. The other thing is to remember that FiO2 and PEEP, those two things are the ingredients for oxygenation. And if you think about to video number one, we talked about tidal volume and rate. And I said that's what equals minute ventilation and that's what regulates our ventilation side. So ventilator management is oxygenation and ventilation. It's that simple. We have to understand how to, how to manipulate each one. So we've already learned ventilation and now we need to learn oxygenation and it's PEEP and FiO2. So another aspect of lowering your FiO2 is to optimize and raise your PEEP up a little bit more to allow you to drop your FiO2 down to a safer amount. Remember, physiology, we live at 21% oxygen. We don't need a lot more than that. So going excessively for a long period of time is going to cause problems. So the new science is increase your PEEP, even if it's 8, 10 centimeters of water, and lower that FiO2 down to as low as possible to maintain that O2 sat that we've already laid out. So the exceptions are trauma. Obviously trauma, you have to think about the delivery of oxygen. The number one thing that affects the delivery of oxygen is our hemoglobin concentration. So you should always be thinking about what's my hemoglobin concentration. If you're transferring your patients, what is your H&H? &H? Look at that and identify that. If you have a low H&H, &H, you can have very poor oxygen uh, storage and you're not going to be able to utilize that in a patient that is hyperdynamic that has a huge demand. So optimizing your FiO2 in a trauma patient that has massive hemorrhage is absolutely warranted. And then the second thing is a pregnancy patient. One of the big things that we forget is pregnancy causes a huge increase in plasma volume, huge increase in red blood cells. Um, you're, you're, the, these moms have to oxygenate not only them but they're, they're making a baby, this baby's growing, and they have to have a huge amount of O2 reserves. Their functional residual capacity, the, the amount of air that they take in, their tidal volume actually increases. But then you also have this baby that's growing that's compressing up on the diaphragm. So we have to always understand that um, they live at a very high P, 
PO2 range. They have a higher amount of partial pressure of oxygen than we do. And just for them to drop their PO2 down in, below 90 <clears throat> millimeters of mercury is going to cause issues. And it can actually put them into preterm labor. So pregnancy patients, whether in trauma or any other pr presentation, always, always, always 100% FIO2. Uh, make sure you optimize that uh, that partial pressure of oxygen, keep that above 90, uh, and, and you're not going to have the issues. You start seeing a, a, a mom go into preterm labor, start having contractions, things like that, immediately add oxygen, as high amounts as you can go to try to get the, that PO2 up as high as possible. That's all I have for FIO2. This is a quick synopsis. We'll dive into FIO2 and PEEP and, and, and what's called the PEEP FIO2 slide and how to optimize the PEEP and lower the FIO2 in later presentations. But I just wanted to give you a great overview of FIO2, everything that kind of plays into FIO2 and the physiology behind the inflammatory cascades and O2 toxicity. I will see you on the next video um, and we'll talk to you soon.